Thank you, Cornell. So my name is Sofia Raskodnikova, and I'm from Penn State. And this year, I'm on sabbatical at uh, Boston University. Um, many types of data can be represented as graphs, uh, where nodes correspond to individuals, and edges capture relationships between them. Examples include friendships in online social networks, financial transactions, email communication, health networks, <coughs> romantic relationships, and so on. So for this audience, I don't have to argue that we have to be careful when we publish information about this type of data as much as we're careful when we're publishing information about other types of data. Um, in, so no talk on privacy and graphs is complete without this picture. <laughs> so let, let me ask who has not seen the, or who has seen this picture before? Not everybody. Okay, so let me just <laughs> mention. So this is a, a picture of a social network of romantic relationships in uh, a real American high school published as is in a famous sociological study. So they stripped all obviously identifying information, um, so the, but they kept completely the graph structure and the genders of the nodes of the, of the people. And um, I guess since most people actually saw this graph before, I'm not going to spend much time talking about it. I'm, I'm just going to point out some um, nodes which are very unique in, in the graph. So this is one node. Um, this is um, another node. And um, in fact, there are lots of unique looking nodes in this network. And uh, more generally, it's been pointed out that uh, in social networks, if you look at small neighborhood of a node, it will uniquely identify the node. And it has been used to de-anonymize um, naively anonymized social networks. So we have to be careful, obviously, when we publish information um, about graphs. So you might ask who, who would want to de-anonymize a social network? Well, NSA, um, maybe fishers and spammers to make messages to you more believable and personalizable. Maybe Arvind Narayanan. Uh, but there are definitely people out there who try to do this and publish attacks on social networks. And again, I'm not going to focus on this at all. I just want to mention that they exist. And at the high level, basically, you can re-identify individuals uh, in naively, uh, naively uh, um, anonymized social network. And most of these things work on um, um, using information from external sources. OK, so what are we going to do about it? So again, for this crowd, I'm, I'm not going to argue that we need a rigorous definition. And uh, so we're going to talk dif uh, use differential privacy. Um, and differential privacy in graphs is defined the same way as uh, um, for uh, databases. So the only difference is so our input is a graph. So otherwise, everything looks exactly the same. So the only thing I haven't specified here is neighbors, right? So we're, the condition of differential privacy holds for two neighboring databases. In this case, the neighboring data, uh, data sets are graphs. Um, and I have to say what I mean by neighbors. Okay, so there are two natural notions of neighbors and graphs. And they correspond to two variants of differential privacy, edge differential privacy and no differential privacy. So let me ask, who has not seen this before? Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll go over it. So, uh, so the first, first definition corresponds to notion of neighbors, where the graphs actually are neighbors if they differ in exactly one edge. Right? So just go through, through the whole definition. So it gives you <coughs> edge differential privacy. And naturally, so no differential <coughs> privacy um, corresponds to notion of neighbors, where um, two graphs are neighbors if they can, one can be obtained from the other by adding or removing a node and its adjacent edges. So node dif differential privacy is more in this period of protecting privacy of each individual, but naturally it's harder to obtain because you have to protect, you, you have to safeguard against much larger changes in your data. Okay, so in both cases, we have two conflicting goals, utility and privacy, and for 
even simplest um, statistics on graphs, it turns out that it's impossible to get both in the worst case. Um, so what we're going to try to achieve is differential, differentially private algorithms that are accurate on realistic graphs. So we're not going to give up privacy. Our um, algorithms are going to be private on all graphs. But uh, we have to then give up accuracy on some graphs, and we're going to choose the graphs on which our algorithms work well carefully. Okay, so our algorithms are going to be accurate for a subclass of graphs and differentially private for all graphs. Okay, so what graph statistics are we going to consider? Uh, so we'll look at simple um, graph statistics, the number of edges, accounts of small subgraphs. So for example, triangle to triangle in the graph is a three click like this. Um, K triangles, so it's a bipartite graph. Sorry, no, it's not bipartite. So it's an edge connected to um, a bunch um, of nodes. Um, it would be bipartite if you, if you remove this edge. Um, and K stars, so our uh, nodes were, which are connected to K other nodes. <laughs> Um, degree distribution, so degree distribution is a vector uh, where for each degree in the graph we specify the fraction of nodes which have that degree. Um, so some other things that have been, so people looked at lots of metrics and um, so this three I'm going to focus on today, but uh, so let me just mention other things, things that people looked at. So cut sizes, um, so cut sizes just uh, given a, a cut in the graph. Um, how many edges cross it, uh, distance to nearest graph with a certain property, and people looked at other things that maybe I'll, I'll uh, mention later. Joint degree distribution, sorry, I had more. Um, so let me um, mention, so what was known, so there's a, a, a number of papers that came out in 2003, and um, so let me mention what was known prior to 2000, uh, sorry, 2013. So this is edge differentially private algorithms before this year, um, and so graph statistics for which they work and the corresponding techniques that were used. So we knew how to release the number of triangles and the cost of the minimum spanning tree, and the technique uh, there was smooth and steady. So I'm just going to go over this, just kind of mention to give you a feeling for what's known, and then I'm going to get into details about some, some algorithms. So we know how to degree, uh, release degree distribution. And uh, um, so the idea is there you can just use global sensitivity and then the whole ingenuity goes into post-processing and there's been several methods which were suggested on how to post-process the data in order to remove some of the noise. And uh, they're quite ingenious. Um, and actually work well in real data. Um, Releasing small subgraph counts, so it's uh, based on smooth sensitivity and a uh, variant of proposed test and release. Uh, for cuts, so um, this uh, two lines of work have incomparable guarantees. So the first one is based on random projections and global sensitivity, and there are the guarantees for every cut. So for, sorry, for a specific cut with high probability, you get some bounds on the noise in your answer. And so in this um, method, iterative updates, you, you have a guarantee for all, gra for all cuts with high probability. And um, so here there is more noise that's um, considered a gain. So there, I'm just going to mention things without you know, explaining them just to give you a feeling that there, there is work going on. So there has uh, been um, work on Kronecker graph uh, model parameters, and uh, if I understand correctly, that's uh, based on post-processing also. Um, sorry. There, there are, uh, so I found lots of uh, papers which mention differential privacy and graphs, and Cynthia wanted me to actually say this. So like for, for some of them, basically there is actually no rigorous explanation, like or I couldn't find rigorous explanation of what's going on in the paper, so I, um, just didn't include them, but some papers I just, um, I guess, didn't probably didn't find or don't, don't I'm not aware of. So um, there's lots of uh, work on uh, graphs and differential privacy, or at least people are aware of it and trying to do this. And uh, some 
some papers actually are just saying strange things. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you can ask me in person uh, <laughs> what, they're, what they're saying. So there are other definitions um, besides the two definitions which are uh, kind of most uh, uh, often used. So let me mention them. So there is uh, edge private uh, against Bayesian adversary. So it's a weaker definition than differential privacy. And so it's, uh, uh, they released small subdraft counts by, by, uh, in 2009. By, by now we know uh, how, uh, to, how to release subdraft counts with differential privacy. So with stronger privacy definition with less noise than uh, was done in this paper. There is no zero knowledge uh, privacy, which is, in principle, it's a stronger privacy guarantee than differential privacy. Um, and so there is an edge version and node version. And so in this paper, so they define this, and there's lots of uh, nice work that goes into definitions there and kind of understanding them. And so what they output the average degree, which is basically the same as the number of edges, um, distances to nearest connected graph, Eulerian graph, and cycle-free graphs. And um, so there, um, the idea is, so they use sublinear time algorithms and then use global sensitivity framework. And the um, kind of, it's, um, the, the main restriction there, so, so they actually talk about node zero, uh, pr node zero, uh, node um, zero knowledge privacy, but they uh, assume that their graph is bounded degree. So they give privacy only for bounded, de bounded degree graphs. And uh, so in, basically if you have privacy for, um, in, with respect to edges, in most cases it's kind of easy to get privacy for bounded degree graphs, right? Because in bounded degree graphs you're just changing a few edges. So they, they their definition is, so f which they achieve is actually uh, weaker than no differential privacy. Oh, and I wanted to mention, so there are, there are other papers. Um, so for example, is the Christine here, Christine Tusk? Yeah, so her paper on uh, outlink privacy, I guess you can talk to her about it. So the model there is uh, slightly different. So it's, uh, it's not that you're given the graph in advance, the algorithm accesses the graph by um, surveying people and just getting partial information about the graph. And the, the model is not entirely clear to me, so maybe I can talk to Christine if you um, have questions about that. Okay, so um, so hopefully I gave you an overview of um, what's been going on before 2013. So in 2013, there are three papers that came out um, basically uh, almost at the same time, so um, in, the, in this order. And they uh, propose new techniques, and they achieve differential privacy for uh, no differential privacy, and uh, which some papers claimed uh, before that uh, was probably impossible to achieve. Um, and uh, also, if you use these techniques, you can get better edge differentially private algorithms. So what I'm going to focus on today is this, the techniques that are proposed in these papers. And please feel free to stop me and ask questions. And so. Um, these papers uh, actually give, provide guarantees for resulting algorithms. So there's formal utility analysis there, um, actually in, in the last two papers. Um, so, the, so again, the algorithms are no differentially private for all graphs. Um, they're accurate for subgraphs, uh, subclass of graphs, which includes um, bounded degree graphs, where the degree bound is not necessarily constant, just some sublinear bound. Um, graphs where the tail of the degree distribution is not too heavy. I'm not going to explain that, just you know, just leave it informal. And that's graphs. So I'm not going to be talking much about utility guarantees today, just I had to pick what to talk about, but I guess uh, there is utility analysis in, in these two papers. So in the, in the second and the third paper. Yes, yeah, so and this, this is not a paper yet, it's uh, just uh, I wanted to explain a, new, a newer algorithm. So, um, and there, there are some experiments that have been done with these algorithms, and uh, they perform, um, so the, the performance is promising in real graphs for very simple statistics. So what I'm going to focus on today is um, no differentially private algorithms for, for releasing this like simplest kinds of statistics, number of edges, counts of small subgraphs, and also the degree distribution. So the degree distribution is a little different because it's, just, it's not just one number that you have to release, it's a whole vector, so you have to think about it a little um, 
And mostly what I'm going to be focusing on is this uh, new technique. So there are three techniques that I'm going to uh, try to explain if I get to it. So the first one is truncation plus more sensitivity. Um, the second one is Lipschitz extension. And the third one is recursive mechanism. And uh, so truncation plus more sensitivity, so some merit on, on that was proposed in um, Blocky et al. and also in our paper with, um, I guess nobody is uh, here from Blocky et al. I guess it was too early or said that he might be here. And uh, in our paper with uh, uh, Kobe and um, Shiva and uh, Adam. And also Lipschitz extension, so some variants on this have been proposed in both papers. And um, a recursive mechanism is a paper which um, I guess I, I just discovered <laughs> for myself. And uh, I'll try to, like, I, I don't know why it's called recursive mechanism. And I changed all other names that they gave to the things, but this one I, I didn't change. <laughs> it's the name of the paper. Okay, so the unifying idea is some kind of projections on graphs with low sensitivity. And actually, everything here should be in quotes projections on graphs. And, <laughs> sensitivity also like, depends what you mean on sensitivity. So that's kind of the unifying idea. Um, and so I'll try to present as much as I can get to like so four things. So generic reductions to privacy over bounded degree graphs. So as I mentioned, bounded degree graphs somehow seems easier to achieve once, once you have edge privacy. And so this uses the first method, uh, truncation and smooth sensitivity. So I will just briefly mention what's going on there and will not go into details. So then releasing number of edges and subgraph counts using Lipschitz extension via maximum flow in linear programming. So I will explain what's going on there. And then releasing degree distribution. So it's also via Lipschitz extension, it's via convex programming. I'll also try to get there. And this recursive mechanism. Uh, um, so I'll explain it on the example of releasing gra subgraph counts, but the, the, the paper is phrased very generally. And I guess I don't quite understand the the ceiling of what it can achieve. And I think it's a very interesting technique and kind of different looking a little bit from other things we've tried. OK, so let's try to delve into technical details. So the basic question we're trying to answer, so we're given a graph. So there is some, it's stored in some, uh, some trusted um, place. And uh, so the users ask a question. So they ask for some statistics, and they get some approximation f of g. And the question is, how accurately can an epsilon differentially private algorithm release f of g? And specifically, again, so I'm going to be presenting these te techniques as they apply to node privacy, but you can also apply them to edge privacy. And in some places, given modifications are very clear what you need to do, just kind of let as less noise, just because you yeah, want edge differential privacy. OK, so what, what, are, what is the challenge for node uh, privacy? So why it's, it took a while uh, for us to uh, think of first algorithms which um, get node private algorithms. So one of the thing is, things is that basically, in the worst case, we cannot get good noise. But it's true also about edge privacy. So here, things seem to be a little more challenging. So, so global sensitivity, so I, I hope most people, so we've seen so many times that most people are uh, used to the notion. So I'm going to denote it by delta F. So in node global sensitivity, so it's the maximum. So how much can I change the value of my function if I go from this database to a na neighboring database, meaning the graph that differs in one node and all adjacent edges. So here are examples. So uh, for the, so I'm going to denote the number of edges like this and the number of triangles like this. So um, what's the global sensitivity of the number of edges um, in the graph? So basically, if I go to a neighboring graph from a graph with n nodes, um, so by, by how much can I change the number of edges? So this turns out to be the worst thing you can do. Right? So add a node connected to everybody. So the global sensitivity of the number of edges is n. Okay, so for the number of triangles, so again, the worst thing you can do is add a node connected to everybody. So it turns out that the global sensitivity of the number of triangles is n choose 2. So are there any questions? Everybody is happy with this? I guess you're going to get a better talk out of me if you ask questions. It's fine. <laughs> what? No, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. OK. Um, so this is the global sensitivity notion. So one thing is. Uh, so global sensitivity is high for these quantities, right? So we cannot just, especially for sparse graphs, so the social networks, we're talking about social networks, we cannot use our familiar uh, Laplace mechanism and just add noise according to global sensitivity. 
Moreover, this notion of local sensitivity, which we, um, so it was defined with, sorry, I didn't have a reference here, so we have a paper with Kobe and uh, Adam. And so, which we kind of used as our guideline um, in edge privacy um, is also high. So uh, it turns out you can not just um, add noise proportional to local sensitivity, but uh, you can strive to be kind of proportional to it in terms of how you add noise um, and be compatible with it on good graphs. Right? So this is the local sensitivity which we use, but I'm not going to be using it, um, so it's not important that you kind of understand the definition uh, carefully. So there is a new measure of sensitivity which, proposed, uh, which is proposed in the recursive mechanism paper by uh, Chen and Zhao, uh, which I call down sensitivity, so as I said, they changed their names. Um, so it's uh, basically how much can I change the function by going from the graph that I'm given from the specific graph um, and removing a node and adjacent edges. Right? So here I'm allowed to do any operation, remove or add, and here I'm only um, allowed to remove. And so for graphs, for, for graph statistics, especially the statistics that we're looking at, this notion um, so this quantity is much lower, right? So as I, I was showing, so by adding a node connected to everybody, yes, Tony. So it's the maximum by which I can change the value of my function in the current graph. So I'm given graph G, right? So how much can I change the value of the function at the graph? So F of G, this is the value of the function, by going to uh, a neighbor, which is a subgraph. So basically how much can I change the value of my function by removing a node and adjacent edges. Right, so in local sensitivity, I'm allowed, so I'm asking how much can I change the value of the function by adding or removing a node? And here I'm only allowed to remove a node. So if we look at the number. Is this is a, you're starting from a particular graph. In the worst case, right, so, but we're, as I said, we're not going for the worst case. So, for, uh, so if we're looking at a typical social network, right, so what, um, so, so, so worst case is not achievable here if you want both privacy and utility. So if you're looking at a typical social network, right, so by, so as I, as I said, like, so the thing that maximizes local sensitivity, right, so I'm going to add a node connected to everybody. And so let's say for the number of edges, it's going to be the, glo the local sensitivity up is N. But uh, so how much can I change how many edges can I change by removing a node? So it's the degree, right? So the actual degree of the largest node, uh, la largest degree in the graph. So it could be much less, right? So, and the same for, for, the, for, for the number of triangles, it gets even more drastic because it's uh, down sensitivity is what's the largest number, number of triangles a single node is involved in, right? So even for high degree nodes, it might not be that high. So, so I'm just giving it as a kind of a measure to, to think about and so for, for the algorithms that I'm going to present, you can actually show that um, basically on good instances, you are adding noise roughly proportional to this. But again, as I said, I'm not going to give utility analysis, but I just kind of find this measure useful to think about. So this is kind of intuitively what we're striving to, to achieve. Right, so for, for, for the local sensitivity, so the reason we thought about it as kind of a good measure is because it, it can serve as a lower bound in some sense. So if you have two databases, which kind of between them, this local sensitivity is achieved, then on one of them, you have to know add noise proportional to this local sensitivity. But so the whole idea here is that you're going to choose carefully on which one, and then the one which is kind of your typical graph, you're going to add less noise, basically. So, um, so the idea, kind of high level idea, is to project onto graphs with low down sensitivity in, in some sense. Okay, so um, so a uh, first example that um, uh, people came up, came up with uh, of graphs with a low down sensitivity is graphs of small degree. So in, um, in this first two papers, so projection, uh, so like in projections, we try to do um, projections onto graphs of small degree. So let G be the family of all graphs. So we're trying to be private for, for this entire family. And let G sub D be the family of graphs of degree bound at most D. So as before, so delta of F is global sensitivity over G, and delta sub D of F is global sensitivity over um, G sub D over this um, family. And uh, so it's, it's not hard to observe that even global sensitivity is 
low for many useful functions f if you just basically postulate that your graphs are always coming from low degree graphs. And so coming back to our examples with the number of uh, edges and the number of triangles, so now the global sensitivity is going to be d and d choose 2 respectively compared to n and n choose 2, which could be significantly lower. Okay, so if we just postulate that all our graphs have low degree, we're done. We can just use global sensitivity framework. But uh, we want privacy for all graphs. And in fact, let, let me also mention that uh, typical social networks are not just graphs of low degree. They are close to graphs of low degree, but they typically have some number of high degree nodes. So if we, we want, so th these are also uh, good graphs on which we uh, want to do well. So in some sense, we're going to try to project from this space of all graphs to graphs of bounded degree. And um, so for some carefully chosen uh, degree bound. And this I'm going to sweep under the carpet on uh, how we're going to choose the degree bound. And there are some um, open questions there, actually, how to do it well. So we know how to do it in some way, but not clear that we know how to do it in the best way. OK, so I'm going to talk, try to talk about three methods. Truncation and smooth sensitivity is the first method. Um, so again, so you can think about it as a reduction to privacy over bounded degree graphs. And what I'm going to explain is a reduction from um, our paper with Shiva, uh, Kobe, and Adam. But uh, there is kind of a reduction that achieves kind of similar thing in the paper of Blocky et al. Um, so our reduction, so our truncation operation is much simpler. There is more sophisticated. So as a result, we get better running time. And in terms of noise, it's not clear. It uh, seems in, in, incomparable what they do. But kind of the, the high-level ideas are similar. OK, so kind of at the high level, basically what it achieves is for any algorithm that is no differentially private over bounded deg degree graphs, so basically you can get an algorithm that is no differentially private over all graphs. And it has accuracy similar to the original algorithm over nice graphs in, in, in some sense. So kind of the first step in understanding no differential privacy is getting no differentially private algorithms on bounded degree graphs. And the reduction is very efficient um, in terms of, and, and actually it, it is easy to implement. My, student, uh, my undergraduate student implemented it. And um, um, so, as, so like the, the other methods uh, do much better in terms of noise. So I'm not going to spend much more time on it. So it's just kind of a very generic method, very easy to implement method. But, um, um, probably adds more noise than we would like on realistic graphs. OK, so how does it work? So the idea is very simple. So we're going to project on graphs on low degree by uh, doing um, the separation t, which is just a simple truncation. So we're just going to cut out all nodes of degree larger than d. And again, in uh, Blocky et al, they do some more careful removal, which takes longer. But then as a result, they um, have to add more noise in uh, slightly more noise in the second step. OK, uh, so, uh, so we answer queries on this truncated graph instead of the actual graph. So basically, we truncate it. And now like, well, we're going to compute the number of triangles. I just mentioned your paper. Um, okay. the you were <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I appreciate it. It's pretty early. Thank you. <laughs> so we're answering. Uh, questions on the truncated graph. So for example, now that we truncated the graph, we're just going to output the number of triangles there. <coughs> um, and so one way of doing this is just answer queries with this, the smooth sensitivity framework, which I didn't describe, but it's kind of some way of making this local sensitivity um, idea work. So I said you cannot add noise according to local sensitivity. But uh, in paper with uh, Kobe and Adam, so we showed how to smooth it out and uh, add noise according to it. And another way of doing this is um, the um, a proposed uh, test reject uh, variant. Did I see you programmed it into me? <laughs> Sorry. So Adam always gets confused and he programmed it into me to say this. <laughs> <laughs> Proposed test release, yeah, sorry. I do this. <laughs> I always mis-expand that acronym. <laughs> and I always laugh at him, and now I did it too. <laughs> OK, we don't reject it. <laughs> we release it. 
but I guess uh, in some talks, rejected functions are functions we care about, right? Or rejected. So. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so I just wanted to mention it. Hypothesis testing, that's Kunal's point. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, so kind of, uh, so the algorithm itself is very simple. Again, the high level idea, so you, you just truncate the graph, you compute this quantity called smooth sensitivity on this graph of, uh, of this truncation operation. And to get the um, smooth sensitivity over, over, over the overall quantity, so it basically composes well, so you can add noise according, uh, according to the smooth sensitivity over um, the whole operator, which is just a product of the smooth sensitivity of the truncation operation for this graph, and the global sensitivity with respect to bounded degree graphs of the function that you want to release. So basically, this is the same. Just once you have a graph, you can just compute this, and then for other statistics, you just compute global sensitivity, which is easy, and just release according to this. Okay, but I'm not going to focus on this method uh, um, because it didn't do well in practice. Um, okay, so let me. Um, so I'm going to spend much more time on method two, which is Lipschitz extensions. Okay, and this idea was proposed in. Um, both Blocky et al. and Kashiba um, Schwann um, et al. So a function, f prime, is a Lipschitz extension uh, of f from bounded degree graphs, uh, graphs of um, 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 degree at most d, to general graphs if it agrees with f on bounded degree graphs, meaning it produces the same answers. And moreover, the global sensitivity of this new function overall is the same as it was on the smaller set. Right? So we basically take, so here's a picture. So we have um, some function where global sensitivity is low in bounded degree graphs and high in general. And what we do, uh, we define uh, f prime to be the same on this, this part. And then we just extend it to be uh, the same, to have the same global sensitivity everywhere else. Right? And, uh, so global sensitivity is called, also called Lipschitz constant, so that's why we call it Lipschitz extensions. Okay, so is it clear what we're trying to do? So I, I guess this, is, this definition is good to understand because I'm going to spend some time on, on this method. Questions about this? Good. Okay, and then, so once we have this function, so we're just going to release this Lipschitz extension via the glo global sensitivity framework using the fact that it has low global sensitivity. And then, uh, so basically, I'm not going to prove this, but on, for, for the statistics we care about, you just, uh, we can just prove that when you do the separation on graphs which are close to bounded degree graphs, you don't lose too much. So this first step, when you go to shift to f prime instead of f, doesn't lose too much. Okay, so Floggy et al. proved that there exist Lipschitz extensions for all real, real valued functions. Um, And uh, so Lipschitz extensions, moreover, can be computed efficiently in, in, in polynomial time. Um, so uh, we show that it can be done for subgraph counts and also for degree distribution. And I'm going to show you this uh, li efficient Lipschitz extensions. And so notice that um, degree distribution is not real valued function. It's a vector of a real value. So um, even the existence of this does not follow from, from this result. Okay, so um, let's look at the Lipschitz extension for the number of edges. So the, the idea here is to use the flow graph. And if I have time, I'll, I'll show you experiments for, for this. So this worked actually very well, even on huge graphs. Um, so, for, uh, for gra uh, so for given a graph, we define um, a flow, corresponding flow graph of G as follows. So we just make two copies of each node. And uh, two copies of each edge. Right? So basically, we added an uh, edge, so it's symmetric for um, u of v prime, if and only if u of v is in e. Okay, so, and then we add a source. Oh, so here we put capacities one on all these edges, and so here we add a source, a source and capacities d on all edges coming out of the source, and here we add a sink and capacity d edges on um, all. Uh, coming into the source, oh, sorry, coming into the sink. And uh, so now we compute, we can compute the uh, maximum flow on this graph, 
and we define <coughs> v sub flow uh, to be the value of the maximum flow here. So, and this is the function we're going to look at, so this fu function which we can efficiently compute. Um, so the claim is that this function over two is a Lipschitz extension of the number of edges. And this is uh, easy to show. I'm not sure, um, let me at least state what we have to show. So like, remember, in order to see that it's a Lipschitz extension, we have to show that, in fact, it has the right value for bounded degree graphs, and also that the global sensitivity um, in general is equal to the global sensitivity on bounded degree graphs. So here I just multiplied everything by two. Um, so who has seen this proof before? Should I, should I repeat this proof? Or because, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, okay. So it's, it's actually fairly easy, and just uh, I'm, I'm worried that I packed too much material into the talk. Um, okay, so. Um, Someone, John was making fun of me for not raising my hand. But... <laughs> 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 oh, you have? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, it changes the picture, maybe I should. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's let's see why. Okay, so fir first uh, let's see why the um, uh, flow is actually equals to two times the number of edges um, in this graph. So first of all, notice that we um, can achieve the following flow. We can just put um, flow of um, one on the this middle edges and flow corresponding to the degree on the edges coming up, um, out of the source and into the sink. And uh, so this re the resulting flow is going to have um, two times the number of edges um, uh, value. And this flow is indeed the maximum flow because this cut has two times the number of edges um, capacity. So that's the whole proof here. So now uh, let's prove that uh, uh, the global sensitivity of this flow function is, is uh, at most two times the um, global sensitivity over bounded degree graphs. And recall that the global sensitivity over bounded degree graphs was just d, so this is equal to 2d. Um, so how we're going to show that the global sensitivity is 2d, or um, maybe at most 2d, um, so, but it is actually 2d. Um, so we're just going to consider an arbitrary graph and its neighbor, right? So, and the, uh, so we'll see what change um, we get into the value of the function on, on this graph and its neighbor. So this is an arbitrary graph. And now when I add one node to the graph, let's see what's going to happen to this uh, flow graph. So I'm going to add two copies of this node in the flow graph. I'm going to add the corresponding capacity Z edges, and I'm going to uh, add the corresponding uh, intermediate edges here. And um, so now, um, by how much can it change my flow? Well, let's consider the size of the mean cut in the original graph. So we can extend it to another cut, which has capacity the same as before, plus 2d. Right? So the maximum flow could not have increased by more than 2d. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so I, uh, and actually, it's, it's easy to show that you can actually achieve 2d. But uh, for the purposes of adding noise, it's uh, not even important. Right? So the, the global sensitivity is at most 2d. Okay, so that's the whole proof. So let's move on uh, to the Lipschitz extension uh, via linear programs. So this idea can be generalized to graph counts by using linear programs. Um, so, um, so now, again, we're given a graph, and we define the corresponding um, LP program with variables. So let, let's, do, um, let's do it for the number of triangles, and then it's easy to see how to extend it to all degree counts. But the, the linear program becomes much larger for larger counts, for counts including larger subgraphs. Uh, so we're going to define linear program with a variable corresponding to each triangle. And what we're going to maximize is um, the sum of these variables over all triangles in the original graph. And so we're going to, um, so this is basically a linear program for computing the number of, sorry, an integer program. Uh, computing for the number of triangles, which is where, where we relax the value of the variable xt, so it can be between 0 and 1. Um, 
So uh, we're kind of, instead of projecting onto graphs, we're projecting on some kind of continuous version of the graphs here. And uh, so the interesting constraint here is that for every node V, we're going to say that the number of triangles which uh, include this node shouldn't be more than what it would have been in bounded degree graphs. So we're not going to allow the, this variables to sum to something more than this. Okay. So this is basically what it's allowed to be in graphs of degree bound D, so the, which corresponds to the global sensitivity in graphs of bounded degree D of the number of triangles. And uh, so the function that we're interested in is uh, the value of this linear program. Right? So this, this is the Lipschitz extension. And I'm not going to prove this, but it's, um, so one can prove that uh, this is indeed a Lipschitz extension. So the two properties that we discussed hold. So, um, and a different way of thinking about it is um, that, so if we use delta here instead of um, this d choose 2 as a bound, so we don't have to put d choose 2 here, so it can be um, some other delta. And then, so what it's going to give us is a function with global sensitivity delta. And you can think about this function as a Lipschitz extension from some set of graphs, which also includes um, bounded degree graphs for corresponding D, for, uh, for which, which is lower than, right, so if you make D choose 2 correspond to this, right? But also it includes other graphs where, um, where this, this holds, right? Where the number of triangles where each, uh, each node is involved uh, in is at most delta. Sorry. Yes, Tony? So can you speak up? Uh, so just go. It's not going to give you integral values, but when, when, you, when you add noise uh, at the end, it also... The oh, how do you know that it's going to give you integral values on bounded degree graphs? So for bounded degree graphs, um, basically... Uh, so, so just uh, just maximizing everything, right? So it's just uh, basically setting all variables, uh, all triangles that exist in the graph, so all variables that you defined, setting them to, to one is going to maximize the linear program, right? It's the only maximal solution, right? And, right. and beyond that, you don't get an integral value. So you just, you just out, uh, so you can, uh, so you can clean it up somehow, but like basically before, before you output it, you still have to add Laplace noise and it's not going to give you an integral value anyway. And uh, so I guess you can round it later, but uh, so yeah, there is a guarantee on how far it is from the actual value, but uh, it, yes, yeah, so, so in fact, uh, I guess they, yeah, so I mentioned there are like nice post-processing techniques for, uh, for the degree distribution, for example, All right? So people, so the output is of course non-integer, but people came up with various uh, nice ideas of how to use and uh, the fact that you know the degree sequence has to look a certain way, that it has to be graphical, for example. So Vishesh is here, it's in his paper. So you use this to actually remove some of the noise. So like the fact that you have additional constraints is good for post-processing. Okay, any other questions about this? Okay, so, and this can be generalized to other counting queries. You can basically, in a similar way, construct linear programs, but they get progressively bigger and uh, less efficient uh, as you look at bigger and bigger cell graphs. Okay, so um, and next thing I would like to ex explain is the Lipschitz extension for functions uh, for function that outputs a vector, right? So it's a, a little um, um, uh, so it's a little uh, different. So we cannot just use this linear program, and then, so namely the function is uh, the um, degree sequence. Sorry, the dis, dis, uh, sorry, degree, distri degree distribution. I guess you can do a degree sequence, but uh, you can, yeah, so degree distribution, I guess, is, well, let's just focus on degree distribution. Okay, so, um, and this is from recent work with Anna. So, um, and uh, it's done via convex programming. So let's go back to our flow graph, and we're able to use the flow graph to get um, an accurate um, quantity with low, uh, sensitivity, which uh, was equal to the number of edges. 
So, uh, to, to, uh, yeah, so which is the average degree. So let's try to see somehow to use this fact maybe to, to see what it gives us for, um, for this nodes, uh, so for, for degrees of the nodes. So maybe we can think about the flow into the vertex V here as um, a proxy for a degree. Okay, so there is a problem with this. And uh, so the issue is that maximum flow is not unique. So the flow itself, right? So the value is unique. This is what we used before, we, we output it. But the maximum flow is not unique. Um, so what we would like to get is a unique flow that has low global sensitivity. OK, so how are we going to do this? So we're going to um, maximize a different function. So instead of maximizing um, the sum of the flows, um, we're going to maximize the sum of some function of the flow. And this function is just going to be a concave, uh, strictly concave function, which is strictly increasing on the interval from um, 0 to d. So this is an example of such, such a function. So maybe it's not very important what the specific function is. It looks like this. And this is what we're going to maximize. Okay, so um, let, so consider the flow of phi, which actually maximizes this expression, right? So the sum of the, this function applied to the flows here. And let f star be the vector that we get here, this out vector of s. Um, and this is what we're going to use as a proxy for, for the degree, um, for the degrees of the vertices. So now f star is unique because um, h is strictly concave, right? So uh, right, so if I get two um, maxim maximums, then I can just uh, use a linear combination. It has to be um, higher, right? so I have a better value. So it also can be computed in polynomial time. And thank you for uh, to uh, Sasha and Kunal for the up-to-date reference on the best algorithm for this. Um, okay, so and so this is what we're going to do. So let's see uh, why it works. So, so again, so this is the, the flow which maximizes question <laughs> to Sasha. I guess yeah, yes. <laughs> no talking. Okay, so so this is the flow that maximizes this expression, um, and uh, so again, so F star uh, is the flow that we get on on the, on these edges. And uh, uh, so for bounded degree graphs, so with a degree, degree bound d, uh, this f star is actually um, a good proxy for the degree. It's exactly equal to the degree. And this is true because h is strictly increasing on this interval. Right, so. And uh, so what we have to prove is uh, that L1 global sensitivity of this quantity so, if we, so in, in the way we defined uh, Lipschitz extensions, we, we have to prove it's at most 2D, but uh, so what we can prove is it's at most 3D, and it's you know, just uh, still a good bound on the noise that we'll, we'll have to add. So this is the only thing that remains to do, is just to prove that uh, a one global sensitivity of this is at most 3D. So let me give, uh, give you just some intuition why it's true. So again, to analyze the global sensitivity, we just compare two graphs that are neighbors and look at the corresponding uh, flow graphs for them. Um, so this is uh, the so we had a node and we had the corresponding uh, edges in the flow graph as before. And so let me call this new edge here E sub S and this new edge here uh, E sub T. Um, so now let's consider, uh, so if we take the new flow, so the flow in this new graph, minus the old flow, uh, so let g be the resulting um, flow function. <coughs> so it turns out that g um, is a un union, okay, so, so not turns out, so, it's a, so g is a, is a union of simple st paths and cycles, and uh, there are several types that uh, um, you have to consider. So the first type is ST paths and cycles that use this first edge. Right? And uh, so how much can they contribute to um, changes in this F star vector? Right? So we're going to measure the changes in terms of L1 norm. 
So um, they contributed most 2D to, this, to the change in the vector. So why is this? So if it's a path, right, so every unit of flow it carries is going to change this vector here by one, right? And if it's a cycle, right, so it's going to change it by at most two, right, if it goes back. So together, it's at most 2D. Okay, so uh, the second type of uh, paths, uh, so we're just here, just we're you know, going to consider just paths, so ST paths, which use ET, this edge, right? So how much do they contribute? So they're just paths, right? So each of them, each unit of flow here is just going to, well, maybe it will go for, for here, right? So it, at most it will contribute um, one to the change in the vector of values. And for cycles, which are using ET, so it's going to be at most zero, right? Because uh, the cycles, right? So if the cycle is here, it doesn't touch this um, uh, vector at all. And if there was a cycle that actually uses one of these edges, it would imply that there is an ST path, so which would mean that this is not maximum flow. And actually, the flow that I, I didn't mention this, but the flow that we find is actually maximum flow. So it's at most zero. And so there are many paths and cycles which don't use these two new edges. Basically, it turns out you can prove that they don't exist. And now you can prove it using um, the strict concavity of the function. So here is the summary of the algorithm. So we construct the flow graph. Um, then we compute this. Uh, so instead of computing the maximum flow, we compute the flow that maximizes the sum of this concave functions applied to um, the flows here. And uh, uh, then we compute, so what we get here, right? So the uh, S out flows um, on, uh, on S. And this is what we release, just basically with Laplace noise 3D over epsilon because um, this quantity has global sensitivity uh, 3D. And after this, you can just use the known post-processing techniques. Um, so I guess some of them requires that you sort um, the values of the vector before releasing. And um, basically, we have very good post-processing techniques for um, removing some of the noise in, in um, the, the degree sequences. Sorry, in the, also in the degree sequences, but also in the degree distribution. Right. So, 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 flow it's like yeah, so I guess you have to be also careful that uh, the global sensitivity of the resulting thing. So there, there are two things we need. Yeah, so maybe, maybe right. so, so so the point is because the original flow, maximum flow, the maximum flow in the original program is not unique, right? Right. Basically, what your perturbation is doing is picking one, right? Right. right. In a way, you. So, but then the question is, you know, can you control the way in which it's picked? Right. So maybe maybe using maybe. random perturbation, there is a nice way to do that. But what we're doing instead is picking a particular maximum flow by adding a strictly concave penalty. Right. That's roughly like taking, you know, I don't know, the centroid of the maximum flows or something like something in the middle of the set of maximum flows, right? Where middle is defined by the strictly yeah, but, but, function. Use more control or you know which one. Yeah, but, but maybe there's a. I mean, which isn't maybe, to say that your approach doesn't yeah, work. I mean, it's just maybe. like you, that's what you have to analyze is what. Yeah, so there are two things that we need, right? So in addition to uniqueness, right? So why, why do we want uniqueness? We want this global sensitivity to be uh, low, but yeah, yeah, maybe it's... Uh, Amanda? Uh, that was my question. Why do we need uniqueness? So, so I, I guess what we want at the end is basically not uniqueness, but the, the, the global sensitivity, right? So we want to control, so, you know, if it can output two different things. Use, uh, so, so basically what can happen if you're just outputting 
uh, like any maximum flow, it can switch between one flow and a very different flow, which is going to have very different values on the vectors that we're, vector that we're putting, which is going to result in high global sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So uniqueness is just but, a but way. Maybe the L1 norm will not change the So if you switch from one flow to an arbitrary other flow, it will change. It will change a lot, right? So that's that's the point. So I guess you want to control how it changes. So uniqueness is it's a, a way of controlling. So you pick the ones that don't differ so much, as much as you can. Uh, and the analysis of this global sensitivity is over all graphs, not the smooth, not the low degree graphs. It's over all graphs, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Like potentially you could have something you mm -hmm. send D, and then like two vertices, one of degree, n over two, one is degree, mm -hmm. n over two minus one, you make mm -hmm. the one with n over two, and all of a sudden. Right, right. Yeah, so we know that flows in greedy, like in a normal way, is not a good way to construct flows, right? So, um, okay, so how much more time do I have for 10 minutes, you said, I can? Yeah, right. sure. So one more method, right? So, so this is a recursive mechanism, and uh, um, it was uh, published in a paper in SIGMOD by Chen and Zhao, two researchers from China. Um, so let me try to explain at a high level. And so I'm going to explain it for a specific example. And I found this paper very <laughs> and, uh, very challenging to, to read. But um, it has very, uh, it has nice ideas uh, in it. So like it's, it's, it is it is like challenging in a different way. It is formal. And I guess they're a little bit low on examples. So they uh, present everything at a very, very abstract level. OK, so. Um, um, so what they give is a strategy for releasing real valued functions. So we're going back to uh, so like one, examples that we're going to be thinking about is uh, the number of triangles, let's say again. Um, uh, so we're going to define a function. So let me just give you an overview of what we're going to try to do. We're going to define a function, um, which they call x, um, so x sub delta um, of our graph. And again, so uh, analogously to previous methods, uh, it's going to have low global sensitivity. Um, so, so as in the projection methods, and uh, also it's going to be so in the projection methods. So the the this, uh, values of LP programs uh, that we got were lower bound than the actual value of the function. So here it's going to be the same story, um, and uh, the larger delta is going to be the closer we're going to be to the actual value, the same as we had in our projection methods. And then we're going to release again similarly. So this is this is the analogy with the old methods. Uh, with the previous method, sorry, uh, x uh, sub delta uh, for carefully chosen delta via the Laplace mechanism. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to explain how to choose this delta, um, even though uh, they, they explain it. Uh, but it, it's a non-trivial part of the, of the paper. Um, OK, so um, how we're going to define the sequence x sub delta. Um, so before defining the sequence, we're going to define another sequence of um, h sub i's, so which are functions of the graph. And so the first, uh, the zeroth one is equal to the zero. The last one is equal to the function that we want to release. So let's uh, keep thinking about the number of triangles as our example. Um, and in there, um, correspond to this inequality, so they're uh, increasing functions. So one function that uh, you can think about uh, there, so h uh, sub i, sorry, it has to be, it, it should supposed to be capital G, h sub i of uh, g is the minimum over all subgraphs of the given graph, of the graph G, uh, capital G, which have I nodes. So size I mean they have I nodes. What's the value, what's the minimum value of my function? So for the number of triangles, um, um, what's the smallest number of triangles I can get in the subgraph of my graph with I nodes? OK, so the property, uh, in order to use the, the mechanism, the properties of HIs that we want is they must be uh, interleaving. And this is Adam's name, no, not their name. Um, so uh, what does it mean? So if we look at the HI of uh, some graph G1, so sorry, if we, if we look for, for two uh, neighboring graphs, G1 and G2, where G1 is the smaller graph, so G2 is obtained by adding one more node, I think, I have a picture. One more node from G1. And so for all i, so if we look at h1 of the smaller graph, it has to be sandwiched 
between HI of G2 and HI plus 1 of G2. So maybe let's see why it holds for, for the specific function um, that uh, we're looking at uh, here. So if we look, um, so maybe even for, simpli for simplicity, let's take the number of triangles uh, as the example. So if we look at the number of triangles um, in the smaller graphs, graphs, so we're looking at the number of triangles and subgraphs with I nodes here, right? And here we're looking at the number of triangles with I nodes in the bigger graph, right? So, and this is the minimum function that we're taking here. So in particular, we can first remove this node, right? And then do the same operation that we did here to remove other nodes to obtain I nodes. So it's definitely going to be at most what we could obtain here, right? And similarly here, so if we look at the number of triangles, um, so in this bigger graph versus the smaller graph, so now we're allowed to remove the same number of, of nodes to obtain, to, to achieve this minimum, right? So naturally here, we're going to be less than or equal to, than here. So, Sophia, the sequence, the, this choice of HIs would work no matter what graphs you have and what pair of adjacent graphs you have. But the way it's written here, given a graph G, define a sequence with these properties where the HIs are interleaving, that suggests that the choice of the H's could depend on the graph. So, so, so you mean, so, so what's the order of quantification? Um, For the triangles, it's so, so, so the, the function, so you just define a function. So, the, so it, each HI is a function of the graph. So the value depends on the graph. But right, but mm. the choice of the HI's, if, if I find a, a, a a collection of HIs that works for a particular graph and all of its neighbors. Will it? Will this be good for all graphs? So, so basically, uh, yes. Uh, um, so it has to. So this property has to hold for all graphs. So it has to extend to all its neighbors, right? So and neighbors of neighbors, but, but right? If I hadn't started with your graph G, if I had started mm -hmm. with some completely other graph, mm -hmm. the choice of functions, the H functions should work for this other graph as well. Right, so it should, it should work in, so like what relates so things between different... So they're by F and they're not determined by G. The choices of H0, H1, H2 depend on F but not on G. Yeah, so the H's are like functions, right? So, so they're, they're functions, right? So, so basically, so you can choose the value of the function depending on G, right? So for, for each G, there is a separate value of the function, right? So, and... For yeah, the, no, 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 so the reason a, to pick edges <laughs> other than, for example, this one would be that for some Fs, other edge, edges may be better, or maybe even for some graph families we care about, other right. edges may be better. Right. And uh, so another reason, which we'll come back uh, to if we have time, is that this is actually hard to compute. It's, it's, it'd be hard to compute. Right? So, um, this is uh, their version of inefficient recursive mechanism. Um, okay. is it? More, more or less, uh, okay. All right, so um, so once we have this um, interleaving functions, so now we're going to define this quantity that uh, we care about, the quantity that we're going to try to release, which will have low global sensitivity, and this quantity itself, so it's a minimum over uh, all H I of G. So, but here, so we add a penalty function. So the lower, uh, the lower is I, so the more nodes we remove from our graph, the higher the penalty. So the penalty is proportional to delta, right? And so it's times the number of nodes we're removing to get this. So that's the function. So it's um, it's uh, it's different. Like it's not like a, I guess exactly a projection. Um, and uh, so we're going to to show that it has low global sensitivity, meaning delta for 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 delta, right? And um, moreover. So we can see that, um, so this quantity is actually equal to the value of the function as long as delta is, su is sufficiently large. Right? So what does sufficiently large mean? Uh, so it means that when we go to a lower i, right, when we're removing one more node, the value of the function um, does not change by more than delta. 
So it's somewhat related to this down sensitivity thing, but no, I'm, I'm just I'm not going into details. Regional <laughs> down sensitivity. Okay, so basically there is some good delta out there, where, which so basically the lower you make the delta, the lower your global sensitivity, but um, you might eventually lose this property that you're going to be equal to your function and uh, eventually you're going to go lower and lower in your lower bounds. Okay, so there is a similar type trade-off to, to previous methods. Okay, so, so this is what kind of the summary of what we have. So HIs must be interleaving. This is what it means. And uh, so this is how this um, function X sub delta is defined. And so I did want to mention briefly why the global I'm running out of time, right? So why the global sensitivity of uh, X sub delta is uh, equal to delta. So how would we, let me just quickly go over the proof. So consider the neighbors such that G1 is a subgraph of G2. So what we want to show is kind of two directions. So the first direction is that um, on the bigger graph, the value of this function is less than or equal to um, the value on the small graph plus delta. And to do this, you can just use uh, the interleaving property. So this is the whole proof of this direction. So let uh, A star be the index that minimizes the expression for X delta on the smaller graph. And then let's see how we can upper bound their X sub delta of G2 on the larger graph. So, uh, if, so the expression for X delta is the minimum. So in particular, if we have substitute I star there, it's going to be less than or equal to the corresponding expression. And so here just we have N plus one because it's a graph on N plus one nodes. And now we just write this out here. And here we just use the interleaving property. So we're going to a uh, smaller graph. So the corresponding h is going to be the upper bound. And this is just equal. So this part is equal by definition to x delta of g2. So plus. So that's the proof. And basically, it's a very similar proof. You can just show that x delta of g1 is less than or equal to x delta of g2. Right? So in fact, here you don't even need delta. Right? So kind of on smaller graphs, graphs it's smaller. So that's, that's all in terms of global sensitivity. And so the, let me mention one more thing. So the example of the function that I, I gave here is, isn't hard to compute. Right? So this is not going to lead to an efficient algorithm. So the natural idea is to use NLP relaxation for this HIs. And again, it's not very hard to do. So basically, just at the high level, um, let's say for the number of triangles, what can we do? So we're just going to write a linear program which captures the number of triangles, and we're just going to relax it. So um, we're going to minimize for over all triangles of G, right? So um, where U, D, and W are triangles. Ah, sorry, we're going to have a variable for each node this time, for each node in the graph. And so we're going to uh, minimize its expression. So if just it doesn't matter which expression is here, basically, if uh, the values are actually zeros and ones, it's going to compute, uh, it's going to output one. If uh, the triangle is there, so sorry, if it's going to output one, and uh, if um, at least one of them is zero, it's just going to be zero. So it's a relaxation of the end function. Okay, so these are the variables. And, uh, and the only other constraint is that the sum of these variables has to be equal to i, right? So we're looking um, i nodes in, in the graph. So that's basically that's uh, the algorithm, right? So they use this um, efficient version of HIs. Um, and now they compute x delta, and uh, I'll put it using global sensitivity framework modular, this uh, thing that uh, I didn't explain how to choose uh, the rate delta. Okay, so that's uh, the summary. So what I uh, try to explain is three new techniques, and I explain them in, in the uh, um, node sensitivity, and as they apply to node sensitivity, but they also improve um, edge differentially private algorithms. So it's truncation plus smooth sensitivity, Lipschitz extensions, and recursive mechanism. The unifying idea is some kind of projections, I guess, for the, for the recursive mechanism is a stretch to think about this projection, on some kind of graphs. So these linear programs are not exactly graphs, but and low sensitivity is kind of this, um, maybe down sensitivity is a good thing to, to think about. So I explained the generic reductions to privacy over bounded degree graphs, which use truncation plus smooth sensitivity. 
releasing the number of edges and subgraph counts using Lipschitz extensions via max flow and linear programming, releasing degree distribution using Lipschitz extension via convex programming, and releasing subgraph counts using the recursive mechanism of uh, chain and gel. And uh, so I'm not going to, I guess, spend any time on this, but uh, there, there are some experiments that has been done. So my, uh, uh, so an undergraduate student, uh, student at Penn State, um, uh, working with me, uh, Edward uh, uh, Liu, evaluated um, our algorithms, uh, which use flow and linear programming. And basically, um, so these are real graphs, and um, you can see that some of them are quite big graphs. And uh, basically, even you know, for, for releasing the number of edges, you get pretty good error, even for smaller epsilon. So, so this is log scale, and this is for the number of triangles. And I guess the running times, so for flow programs, even for huge graphs, they're small. Here, there's some weirdness um, in terms of how long it takes. So this is almost three hours. This is half an hour. But you know, he didn't optimize anything. He, he just didn't, like, took off the shelf. Um, LP package and just use it and just um, okay. So um, so b basically, you know, the, the point is that uh, they're, they're, they can be used. They, I, I guess, if you have a couple of hours, you can output simple statistics and you know they, they add reasonable noise on uh, the uh, realistic graphs, which are like social networks, which uh, are like from Stanford collection, or, like from some of our, our collections. So there are experiments. Um, also, in uh, the recursive mechanism paper, they mostly run them on smaller graphs, and uh, it just appears, so we didn't implement their algorithm, but it just appears that their algorithms take um, too long to, to run on big graphs because uh, their running times are in hours also. Um, so let me just skip this. Um, so conclusions, so we're close to having edge private and node private algorithms that work well in practice for at least basic graph statistics. We have interesting projection type techniques that might be useful for um, designing differentially private algorithms in other contexts, not only for graphs. And uh, so the next thing that I have is a bunch of open problems, but I don't know if you want to cut me off or let me list them, talk about them. OK, so uh, some open, so I have two slides of open problems. So the uh, first uh, type is uh, some new techniques. So this is kind of with respect to what um, I talked about today. So first question is, can special purpose LP solvers make these techniques more efficient? So, um, so as I said, like they're not optimized in any way. He just took off the shell simplex algorithm and just ran, ran, ran it. Um, so to which other queries do they apply? Okay, so um, what's the best way to choose the degrees um, cutoff or sensitivity cutoff? As I said, I swept it under the rug. We have some way of choosing it. It's not clear it gives the best way, so like also in the experiments that Ed ran, they were like much better Ds, so like basically I, I, what I showed is for fixed D. Um, um, so specific queries uh, that uh, it's worth thinking about, so releasing cuts with no differential privacy, so we know how to release them with edge differential privacy, but the error is quite high there, so even when you go to bounded degree graphs, um, it produces too, too much error to give you a meaningful answer, so even just multiplying the error bound by D um, gives you something to hide. Then uh, the question that uh, Ori really wanted me to put, <laughs> open question that Ori really wanted me to mention. So there is a challenge in terms of releasing something really, anything related to distances. So any kind of sensitivity measure seems to be mm. high and just uh, you know it goes to infinity like uh, quickly, like if you remove one node, let's say. Yeah. So, so there is a challenge there. Um, yeah, so I, I guess at some point with, yeah, we thought about how to define it, like maybe some related measures which are more robust, uh, but yeah, there's a challenge there. Um, so what else? So the differentially pri private synthetic graphs. So I mentioned one paper by Rebecca where she did it under some assumptions, right? So, but uh, um, it's uh, pretty much an explored, um, very much an explored area. Um, simultaneous release of answers to many queries, so we have it for um, um, normal databases, but not, not uh, graphs, usual data, standard databases, but not graphs. Uh, what are the right notions of privacy for graph data? So it's also maybe there are some other interesting notions. So I, I very briefly mentioned uh, notions that people were exploring, um, like um, zero uh, knowledge differential privacy. 
where are the right uh, ways to state utility guarantees. So again, I, I didn't talk about it much, so, but uh, um, there are, um, so people, do, uh, people are starting to analyze this uti the utility guarantees of the graph, so, uh, oh, sorry, for the cell graph. So it's challenging, it's challenging because they're not um, doing well in the worst case, right? So you have to think how to um, phrase it that they're doing well for real graphs and in which sense they're doing well. Okay, so either in absolute sense or you know, with respect to some local sensitivity measures like this down sensitivity. Um, so another question, so social networks have node and edge attributes. Um, so what queries are useful? So, and I know that uh, Christine is thinking about these questions. You had uh, a question, an example in your paper where you used node attributes, like simple node attributes, maybe like genders. Um, so what queries do social scientists find useful? What else will, what would they like us to release privately? And finally, hypergraphs. So, so far we talked about graphs, which capture relationships between pairs of people, but um, you know, we can capture relationships between groups of people. So for example, um, people appearing on the same photo, right, could be a relationship. So can really statistics for hypergraphs. Thank you. Sorry. Kristen, okay. Yeah, okay. So one query that social uh, network analysis uh, focuses a lot on that um, you didn't mention but might be interesting is uh, clustering. Is what? Clustering. Clustering, so, clustering coefficients. And well, not just clustering. So clustering coefficients is a measure of transitivity, but there's also clustering in the sense of here's a group of friends. Can I pick out which clump is the Republicans and which clump is the Democrats? Mm -hmm. um, so. In, in that sense, modularity, and there's a lot of different metrics for this. And uh, it's very difficult to do with differential privacy. Um, somebody was using uh, differentially private spectral analysis, which is used for clustering. And I haven't actually read the paper. OK, um, I guess, I, I, guess I, I didn't find probably the paper. Yeah, and so, yeah. I haven't read it yet. But um, yeah, so yeah, there's an open problem that's very challenging, mm -hmm. right? So. so something related to clustering? Right, yeah. so. And what would your output be? Uh, so your output could be, um, we found six groups, for instance. Here are their relative sizes, approximately. Uh -huh. And if you had node attributes to work with, you could say, we think this group is likely interested in this, this group is likely interested in that, and so on. Um, and preferably, if you could, you would say this group is more tightly connected to these other two groups than to this third group. So just the sizes would be, would oh, just be good? Just the sizes would interesting. be interesting. interesting. Yeah, so, so I, I guess if, if everybody knows, that's public information probably, right? So if, if some site is um, Right, so, so I guess if you look uh, with respect to edge privacy, it does something like it basically scales um, sensitivity proportional to the number, to, to the number of um, yeah, connections that you have. So in some sense, it's doing what, what you want already. So like if, it, yeah, if, you, if you just say, you know, it's going to be proportional to... That's, that's kind of like, like saying you know, privacy to the change of a bounded number of edges, 500 edges. Right? Although in, I guess something that Sophia mentioned that may, you know, may have been lost is that these uh, projection type techniques, they give you improved accuracy even for edge sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Wasn't lost. <laughs> oh, okay. Wasn't lost. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I didn't I didn't go over experiments, but uh, so in uh, Chen and Zhao pa paper, they actually show that they're I mean they experiment with their recursive mechanism with respect to edge privacy, and they show that it's doing better than uh, so our paper on releasing graph counts uh, for most queries on which they showed. So uh, again, so there is probably some bottleneck in terms of running time because the techniques we use are very fast, but they they end up adding more adding more noise basically. And, 